survived your chance for proof of this maiden, but I see no maiden. She fed him the richest of foods, and she supplied him with an endless wealth and the promise of her company whenever he desired it. She gave not the slightest indication of being capable of following through on her threats should he tell anyone about her. So of course he betrayed her confidence so easily. If she truly wished for Lanval to keep his silence, she should have made sure he truly understood what his punishment would be for sharing their secret long before he ever left her silken tents. Get on with it! This isn't your prologue, woman! She should have broken the sweet moments with angry threats so that he understood his place in their relationship. Instead of promising him that she would come to him in the blink of an eye, should he ever wish it, she should have told him that she would summon him. She should have planned to leave him longing for her presence, and when he had suffered enough to humble himself, she would bring him to her presence and allow him to join her company. The only way Lanval could have truly believed he would suffer should he fail to keep his promise would be if the fairy girl had given him a taste of that suffering during their brief moments together. He needed to genuinely fear the consequences of his actions in order to keep her warning in front of his mind at all times. No, no, no. See, the problem with this show was that the fairy was a woman. I mean, as I've heard from my dearest of friends, Women are taxing creatures. They nag. They demand unreasonable promises that they know a man can't keep, but they want those promises anyway. And then, when the inevitable happens, they get angry. Picture, if you will. If the fairy were a man, well, that would be different. Men understand each other. They wouldn't expect such unreasonable promises. You're gay? Yeah. Surely, Jerome, since you don't like women either, you get me. He likes virgins. Now wait a minute. Jerome, no one wants to hear it. Marscalco, you spent all your days in a barn. Let the true love expert handle this. 
The problem lies in Lon Ball's character. The roles are reversed. If Lon Ball was a worthy lover, he would have wooed her, not the other way around. He was undeserving of the fairy, and she lowered her standards, which I advise women never to do. In the end, the fairy never should have come back for Lon Ball. A man who cannot keep his promises is not worthy of marital bliss. But they weren't even married! That's the side. Now here's the point of which I can concur. A secret love is the only love that can occur. A love when secret, when revealed, it becomes a wound that can't be healed. So that was interesting. <laughs> I think what we should take away from the finale is that they loved each other. I mean, that woman was taken from man's side. It's only fitting that she returned to, to his side in the end, despite, you know, their imperfections. But she's not even human. She's a fairy. Shut up, Jerome. Hello? Oh, hey. Hey, guys, it's Marie de France. Yeah? Oh, a new light. Okay. Yeah, sounds good. We'll be right over. So Marie's written a new lay. It's called Equiton. She thinks we'll really like it. She wants us to come hear it at Thirsty Mind. What do you guys say? Yeah, yeah. Okay. 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 I mean, I'm excited now. Yeah. yeah. On we go, heel for heel and toe for toe, arm and arm and arm we go, all for Mari's wedding. Over hillways, up and down, myrtle green and bracken brown, past the shilling through the town, all for sake of Mari. Step the gilly on we go, heel for heel and toe for toe, arm and arm and arm we go, all for Mari's wedding. Bertie Harry, 